Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, here to usher you in into the weekend. It is mid-August. We're about two weeks away from uh, school starting here in the local MCPS school system and beyond. So, you know, get all your uh, supplies, get all, all, everything all ready to go and everything like that. Uh, we're going to jump right into your uh, top news this morning. Tropical Storm Hillary is getting closer to California coast for the first time in more than 80 years. The, you know, the U.S. National uh, Hurricane Center said Hillary had sustained winds of 145 miles per hour at 6 a.m. and is expected to continue with rapid in intensification through Friday before starting to weaken. It will nevertheless be, uh, still be a hurricane when it approaches Mexico, Baja, California Peninsula on Saturday night and will approach Southern California on Sunday as a tropical storm. So the only thing, so just a little bit of weather stuff, you know, Gulf of Mexico is where only hurricanes happen. Everywhere else is a tropical storm. That's just because of the, the shape of the Gulf of Mexico and then the winds and all that kind of stuff. It's just very specific to United States because we're special. Anyways, uh, uh, moving on to other top stories Trump is doing with his fourth indictment coming out of a Georgia RICO case that allows the law to interpret a narrative when coming to a large groups of game, gangs and mob bosses that uh, compartmentalize illegal activity. Advisors to Trump have long urged the former president to spend less time airing his grievances about the 2020 elections as he runs for re-election and more time focused on his plans for the future. While such rhetoric animates his loyal base and alienates more moderate and independent voters, as well as often criticized in interviews by longtime Trump supporters who say they feel it's time to move on. Mike Pence also made a statement saying the election wasn't stolen and had no right to be overturned in Georgia's election. So that's kind of what's happened in the top news. Another big thing for the state of Montana is a big win for the Montana youth in climate change front. Montana's constitution reflects a clean and livable climate and how the state of Montana has failed to live up to the Montana values cemented in Montana for the last 50 years. The takeaway from this win is essentially to bring climate change into discussion about fossil fuel production and businesses related to its use. Most of these comes at the heels of the recent legislative session that took out provisions related to greenhouse gases as a factor of climate change. There has been a soft push to open modern mining operations in the state of Montana that have been met with similar lawsuits reflecting the simple idea of disregarding impacts to communities across Montana. I'm not saying that just because there is, uh, there is a mining operation or fuel, a fossil fuel business looking to open up shop should not operate here, but reflect the values of Montana's clean and livable climate because after many years of mining and lumber sunsetting their businesses over the last 50 plus years, people tend to forget the lasting impacts from the Berkeley pit to towns affected by environmental da damages related to various uh, variety of high impact industry. Essentially, this lawsuit is in place to put people on notice that Montana is not owned by the Copper Kings that uh, flexed influence far and wide past Montana's borders. You know, I get it because with the bad history of the Copper Kings of Butte and beyond, the good thing about this mining, uh, that mining operation was the modernization of the U.S. and part of the world. No joke, you know, copper was used for uh, electrification and it was key to modernization of, uh, of like on a large scale. Of course, the biggest takeaway from the story should reflect the accountability when creating uh, world-changing materials. Right now, even cobalt is a source of getting out of fossil fuels, and the African Congo is the majority source right now for creating those EV batteries for the electric cars that America is moving towards. With the bad, there's uh, borderline slave labor for folks in those countries, uh, 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 if not limited to, to using, uh, basically, well, uh, so the slave labor folks, for folks, uh, like maybe they're getting to, like, a dollar to five dollars a day for their operation and most of them don't even have tools to excavate a lot of the min minerals and there's been some video leakage of just some of the uh, the conditions of the mining operations where people are just digging with their hands uh, collecting the cobalt for this and this is the cobalt mine that I believe is like like the, one of the biggest cobalt mines in the world uh, that's been discovered right now um, you know on you know on mold but let's let's just let's, let's get back back to what uh, Missoula is dealing with right now and on a more local level Missoula is dealing with a homeless emergency and a price take for the services from both the city and county will be 1.7 million dollars to reopen the Johnson Street shelter for a year the shelter is due to uh, op uh, open sometime in September um, and it's operated on the faith that the residents who have been challenging in the past through 
either drug slash violent offense that basic staff cannot provide proper security to avoid spillover into neighborhoods. Um, in Wednesday's meeting uh, with City Council mentioned their frustrations with the reopening in September for spillover folks in homes nearby. Most of them, uh, most of all of them want a point of contact for neighbors to voice complaints and concerns in the area. Uh, where there is smoke in Missoula, there's also fire in the northwest of uh, parts of Montana. And so this one specifically is the big knife fire that has grown with our latest uh, heat spell. Uh, the Salish Kootenai Division of Fire uh, reports that the warmer and drier weather is increasing the fire activity at the Big Knife Fire on Tuesday afternoon up in Arlee. This was a lightning caused fire in the area. And so far, helicopters have been dropping water to combat drier weather and there's some of those drier grass areas to help uh, mitigate the spread of the fire. Because when it comes to uh, dealing with the fire season, you can't stop the fires. You just have to uh, make a boundary and contain the fire and let it burn out on its own, which usually takes some time. Um, a couple weeks ago, Governor Greg Gianforte uh, issued a state of emergency in accordance with the drought, con drought conditions with 11 counties, which includes Missoula. The Big Knife Fire is sized at approximately 6,100 6, acres, uh, with a thousand acres increase from Monday and is considered 7% contained as of uh, Thursday. So, um, and then let's talk about some of the other, uh, other fires that are happening around the area. Up in Elmo, there's a fire about 80% contained, the Na Narja fire as it's called and more than 20,000 acres have burned so far. Additional smoke is from uh, burning vegetation from inside the fire's boundaries. Another nearly contained fire is the Mill Pocket Fire with over 2,000 acres burning. The Mill Pocket Fire is still in mop-up status and crews are working to make sure the fire's edge stays cool and no danger is uh, no danger to containment. Um, and of course, here's the official statement on all the fires. And this is what uh, provisions people should take if they're going out camping, going to these places as well. It's called stage two fire restrictions, area in place across the Flathead Indian Reservation. No campfires are allowed. No smoking outside of vehicles. No operating combustible engines from 1 p.m. to 1 a.m. No operating vehicles off uh, designated roads and trails. Residents and visitors are encouraged to visit mtfireinfo.org for more information across Montana. Um, and, uh, you know, speaking of Montana, remember that train derailment? Looks like they're getting another year to clean the asphalt that has spilled into the River of the Yellowstone. Basically, from what the article read is, with the low waters, river crews cannot clean up certain spots further down the river, but approximately 231,000 pounds of asphalt material uh, out of a estimated 419,000 pounds have been removed. The logical impact has affected 20 confirmed animals and a local cleanup task force will remain in the area to respond to reports of asphalt. And if you are in the area and you see some asphalt, you can always uh, email them at rpderailment at mtrail.com. Again, that's rpderailment at mtrail.com. Um, this was an article on Q2 billings, and so they have this link online as well if you want to look that up. So, <clears throat> and speaking of fires um, um, and disasters, uh, we're going to talk about more bad news from the Maui fire that has killed over 100 people in the last week, um, from communication errors to people trying to get out of their homes last minute by jumping into the ocean. A horrific scene of fire and high winds destroyed everything it touched. Even the fire crews in place were unable to see this coming and even uh, warning people. Hawaii is very far away and they uh, are not necessarily connected to the U.S. grid and have the autonomous uh, when it comes to uh, every uh, uh, amenity. Uh, if it wasn't for regular flights, military base, and tourism, then Hawaii would not be any kind of uh, U.S. destination. Uh, one uh, big takeaway from this is the failures of the system in place to keep folks safe. And when they fail, they become the, the, it, the, basically this became the top five deadliest fire disasters in a hundred years of American history. And the last big fire that devastated a uh, town in Ohio, in, in Idaho, sorry, not Ohio, but in Idaho, uh, Wallace in 1910 that killed uh, over 60 people in this uh, logging town. So Hawaii Governor Josh Green came out Wednesday to assure that people who lost their homes will one day be able to return and vow to block anyone from trying to buy the land up from under them despite future legal challenges. Mini Lahara uh, struggled to find a, a afford a life in Hawaii before the fire. Statewide, a typical starter home costs over $1 million, while average renter pays 42% of their income for housing, according to Forbes housing analysts. This is the highest ratio of country by wide margin. Rebuilding lives after disaster is always 
proves challenging. And in this market, it is many places that are dealing with inflationary costs to living in some kind of box. And you know, this is interesting because you know, I was also uh, looking into an article where there's a lot of interest in Wall Street looking into um, uh, the housing market, which in a lot of ways is not necessarily the best sign in the world. So when Wall Street is worried about a recession, it might have to do with the fact that homes are too expensive and people are uh, buying less and less because they're not making enough to uh, justify a purchase of a home. Goldman Sachs revised a home price forecast upward this week saying that the average closing price will climb to 1.8% by this year's end. Previously, it said home prices would fall by 2.2%. Goldman predicts home prices will rise even more next year in part of housing supplies constraints. So if you were listen to that kind of segment that I just mentioned is that projections, you know, the idea that, you know, what is value and that kind of thing. And then when you have Wall Street and then you have the idea, like, I, I want to, like, I'm kind of putting my tinfoil hat on in a little bit from this next section just because housing's kind of gotten out of control just in general. And, and I think that the 20, uh, 2009 recession kind of opened the door for the idea that uh, Wall Street could basically short a uh, housing crisis in the long run. So there's a, a lot of people got rich and even more people lost their homes after the 2009 recession. So housing was harder to get and interest rates went down. You could buy a home from the 90s to the early 2000s at a reasonable price, but with a 10 to 15 percent uh, interest rate, respectfully. Um, and now these rates are going up again, and inflation has shown that housing market for a seller is doing way better because of folks leaving their cities. Gentrification and, and amenities got strained in communities like Missoula that the lower wage earners got pushed out of their rentals as higher rates after the anti-eviction uh, moratorium for the state sunset in many states, uh, not just Montana, but if people were living in debt to debt because paycheck to paycheck seems more like a fantasy these days, we found ourselves in the middle of a national narrative that housing prices have soared. So it's, 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 it's just such an interesting thing because I keep on like running my head around this and I always like to think about it like this is like the US economy is simple if you don't make uh, more money each year uh, each quarter for that matter for some shareholders then you're not a successful business so the existence of a sustainable business is not welcome in the world of Wall Street trading so when you wrap that around the system of middlemen meant to sell you a home and get the projected costs that you negotiate with and the competing costs uh, it's not unusual for companies like BlackRock who is buying up properties and experts telling you it's easier to rent than to buy a home as a home restricts you. So, you know, it's interesting because I was around during the pandemic and, you know, these kind of things started happening and housing prices started kind of going up. It kind of felt like there was a supply a crunch on a lot of the housing in, in, in like in the United States as well. And, you know, I saw those videos uh, of, you know, you know, people going on like Dateline, ABC, and just talking about how it's so much better to rent and how like it's so much free and all that kind of stuff. And it's so interesting just to kind of see that kind of mindset shift in terms of just trying to, you know, like uh, project a, um, a narrative in a way. I don't know. Uh, at the same time, you know, I, you know, you know, um, it's, it's interesting because we're also dealing with the fact that, you know, we're having uh, large amounts of taxes in what our Missoula Mayor Jordan has calls a broken tax system for Montana. You know, this also harkens back to the idea that a clean and livable climate, but at the same time, those mining operations and those kind of uh, institutions that were in place were meant to uh, create those jobs. But at the same time, those operations started having more machinery, and so they had less workers doing the mining and doing those kind of excavating kind of uh, uh, jobs that were were pretty dangerous back in those days, especially. But they had it, it, they had a, a quantity thing rather than a you know less people working uh, more hours. So it's I don't know. I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but like watching a bad movie. If enough people buy into it, they make a sequel, then keep going until they can't make their money back. And that's kind of how it feels about this housing situation that's going on right now. Is that there's a lot of uh, bad actors getting involved with the housing market. So anyways, uh, I'm going to kind of end on that note, uh, take off my tinfoil hat for a little bit and uh, uh, throw you guys over to uh, one of our horror films from our horror camp. This is just this past a week or so. So without further ado, here's this. And when I come back, we're going to talk about some terrible movies.
leave there, little fella. It's a lot harder to train cats than dogs. And if cats don't want to do something, they don't. So in conclusion, it is possible, but plausible. Does anyone have any questions? Hey, I heard you had cookies here. That's the cricket migration lecture. Oh, okay. So what made you interested in training cats? Well, I was thinking of getting one, and so I just thought I'd come here and see. So are you going to? Uh, probably not. Why? Because, like, from the beginning of your lecture, like, you said it's hard to get cats to not scratch, like, your furniture and stuff, and get all messed up. Okay, see ya. You have to wake up! Listen to me! MCAT's kid centric activity is back with Saturday drop-ins starting September 2nd. This weekly creative experience lets kids use stop animation to breathe life into their Legos and more. They're only limited by their imagination, and here at MCAT we promote creativity for kids aged 8 to 14. Ah! Join us inside Missoula Public Library every Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this week. And kicking things off with... We basically got Amazing Spider-Man in this next movie where it's kind of like, yeah, you like Venom, now get ready for the Giver, or more accurate, uh, the Blue Beetle, which follows a, a specific Hispanic super teen on his techno Venom suit and the company military contractor above the law to get back from the uh, protagonist who is uh, bonded with the alien machine till death do them part. You basically have an amazing Spider-Man with Andrew Garfield vibes from this movie, but they include a very large Mexican family as the fast and furious thing shoehorned into this movie, which is rare to see a, a full family in a superhero movie, because um, they usually come from tragedy. Um, Strays, uh, this movie that's coming out starring Will Ferrell and many other celebrities agreed to do a voice, a live action dog uh, that need training to do thing kind of movie. Uh, so anyways, if you like, you know, uh, I don't know, what's that called? Cats versus dogs, cats and dogs, or uh, there's ones where they animate the mouth moving for dogs and they have a conversation, or Dog's Purpose, the Dog's Tale. Those kind of movies, this is basically one of those like parody kind of films where they make fun of it and they just like, what if we did this 
but a horror movie. But in this case, this is like, what if we did this but a raunchy comedy? And so that's kind of like the whole kind of the, the idea behind these kind of movies. So enjoy an already. Uh, Enjoy already jokes that you probably thought about. Uh, a dog would probably say, you know, kind of like, you know, look who's talking now kind of film movie. Because, you know, that they already did a bunch of different kind of like those movies. Anyways, Haunting of Queen Mary. We have people on a haunted boat. Uh, this is the Haunting of Queen Mary. But this boat isn't the only boat as it does a flashback to 1938 story that parallels this present day story. I'm assuming the revelations will happen in the past and to help the present girl uh, beat the ghosties. Then we got the moon, not to be confused with a moon people from the failed sci-fi movie uh, that kind of looked like Armageddon in 2012 where they went to the moon and they were space aliens or whatever. This one is a Korean drama set in the plot of Apollo 13 with a man trying to get an astronaut home safely from a disastrous moon mission. Um, I'm assuming it works out. Back to the strip, so, or back on the strip. So basically it's about a, a, a bunch of has-been strippers coming back together for one last ride. Um, you know, some have, uh, you know, nothing going for them, especially the main guy who wants to bring the band back together because, you know, his life hasn't really gone anywhere and he wants to do this to prove that he's still relevant. So that's what you can expect for this movie. It's also in Vegas, too, so that's what's happening there. And then we have an indie film, which basically is about an alien stepdad. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, for one, am bowing down to our alien stepdad o overlords. Uh, we have those really weird indie films with some comedians playing their independent film dues before they get those Oscar bait movies. And this girl marries an alien because no human can measure up to her standards. Anyways, those are the movies that are coming out this weekend and more, either on streaming or on movies and all that kind of stuff. And you can check that out uh, anytime that you want. But, you know, why bother? Uh, <laughs> Anyways, here is uh, Dub and Stuff uh, from the 1931 movie Grief Street, and when I come back, we're going to talk about some city council. Well, it's not like the food was good or anything, or bad. I'm just saying that uh, some of the service was kind of subpar, and then when I said something about it, they kind of scoffed at me. What about... I don't like the idea of being waited on by the waiter. You know, understand me? They're called waiters for a reason. They're supposed to be waiting on us, and they weren't waiting on me, and I was not really happy about the situation at all. Hmm. So I have one more question for you, Mr. Manager. I want to know exactly what you plan to do about this, about your employees, about just the overall nature of the site and the place that I have to endure. Huh. Perhaps maybe I should just order takeout, but that food would probably just have bad vibes anyways. So if you don't mind, I'd rather not go to Luigi's restaurant because, you know, of what, what happened there. So let's, let's choose somewhere else to go. But I have a long list of places I do not want to go, and you've got to understand and respect my decision. Never. Oof. I'm not going to go to any of those places. So feel free to give me some suggestions for places. I'll be sure to tell you what places I don't want to go to. You understand me? <coughs> Ma'am, Luigi's is an Italian restaurant. You ask for egg rolls and spring rolls and California rolls. You didn't ask for anything specific to the restaurant that is Italian, so you have to be oh, very Come on, clear. honey. Let's get out of here. We don't need to listen to this. Well, here at Papa Luigi's, we respect your input, but we kindly ask you to keep it to yourself next time. Well, looks like we got another Karen. What do you suggest we do? Well, if word gets around that your restaurant is uh, not listening to a person's concerns, you might find yourself in hot water. Yes, but I believe in the dignity of my staff. I well, not... money talks, and if you don't uh, provide a good service to your customers, less money will start showing up to this place. You really ah, want beg that? your pardon. Papa Luigi's been an institution. Uh, he's right. I didn't see it until just now. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you for acknowledging my anger. Well, you know, there's good days, there's bad days, and perhaps this lady was having a bad day. As Mama Luigi once said, stop that, will ya? Get back over here. You don't do that. Don't look at me like that. I'll go tell Papa Luigi, because he's going to whip you good, son boy. Ugh. Those are some good times. I got a lot of whippings. Parents can be cruel. Ugh. Do you believe in corporal punishment? Because I sure do. Uh, well, it is what it is. Is that it? Hey, yo, boss, do you want me to follow that lady home and see what she's all about? Maybe I can find out some things about her. Maybe she won't talk bad about a restaurant. Would you want me to do that? Because I totally can. I used to break kneecaps. <laughs> Uh, he's serious, isn't he? 
Is he serious, isn't he? You can tell me if he's serious. Is he going to do something weird, like mob-like? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, don't follow them and don't break their kneecaps. This isn't what Papa Luigi's all about. Oh, okay, fine. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some city council. Kicking this off uh, for city council is some public comments. Uh, many of them are concerned about different things, and one of them is uh, basically this has been a, a calling uh, uh, a lot of uh, concerns for the people who live at the Flynn Lane Mall in the new uh, development that's being built for the city of Missoula. It's basically, a giant, huge, mega neighborhood just be, being built just down that uh, particular area. It's called the Mullen Road. And so uh, Barbara Pooley is bringing up a concern that's been brought up uh, time and time again in this particular area and has a lot to do with uh, uh, the school's uh, kid population with such a large neighborhood that they're going to be heavily impacted by this. So this is uh, Ms. Pooley. You're planning to consider approving a new 614 housing unit subdivision but are not addressing the consequences to Hellgate Elementary or the high school. You've addressed the sewer, streets, water, etc. But for the residents of these subdivisions, schools are critically important too. Under Montana Code's annotated, the developers must dedicate land to parkland equal to 11% of the fair market value of the unimproved or unsubdivided land. Code section of this Montana Code Subsection 9 states that subject to local governing board, that is you, and acceptance by the school district trustees, a subdivider may dedicate land, a land donation to the school district, adequate to be used for school facilities or buildings. There's another subsection 10 which allows for a cash donation in lieu of land. I would suggest that the Hellgate Elementary School Trustees hold off accepting this subdivision and request a cash donation to be given directly to the Hellgate Elementary and not the city. And, and many of the, the, this isn't the first time someone has voiced concern about the uh, potential uh, baby boom that's going to be happening in this particular area that's going to feed more kids in the schools. And, you know, as she goes on to make a few uh, points related to creating more green spaces to dwelling ratio, there's some very real issues growing in Missoula as we're growing in population. And uh, many, uh, she also mentions that Missoula is kind of turning more into a Jackson Hole in terms of residents who can afford to live in town are wealthy and those who are just struggling to make ends meet are being pushed out. You know, we can build homes for stability, but you cannot, but, but not, uh, but by not building uh, homes um, demand. Oh, wait, wait, wow, why did I write that? Uh, okay, so this, yeah, this is a change in market will affect many current uh, property owners. And I, and I got my adjusted numbers from the, um, the new tax season as well, which basically went up by 3,300 to 4,400 taxable value from 2022 to 2023. So I'm going to be paying uh, 11 more hundred dollars in uh, taxes in less than a year. It then doesn't sound like a 9% uh, tax hike, but maybe that's meant for next year's tax raises. So here is, um, uh, we're going to shift over to another segment and this has a lot to do with uh, Greg Martin who talks about the uh, a plaque that just got delivered uh, to the uh, city of Missoula in terms of his uh, home which it was a former AME black church in the city of Missoula and so this is what he had to say about that. Uh, I have a couple of comments. Uh, one, it's my understanding that the sign from the Montana Historical Society memorializing the St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church on 1427 Phillips Street has been delivered to the city. Uh, I have not yet heard when the sign will be installed or what the city's plans are for promoting this much needed addition to our town's history. I realize it's only recently arrived, but I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage the city to get the word out about this sign and its significance to our understanding of our town's difficult racial history. Please involve the Missoula Black Collective and find a way for us to celebrate this wonderful development. 
Okay, so that was Greg Martin uh, talking a little bit about this, and he did a deep, deep dive into uh, some of the history of Missoula, where he found this information. And the, the, and the dedication for this signage is not set up, but after comments, uh, Mayor Hess addressed this uh, to get this memorial for the AME St. Paul Church done. So Greg Martin also mentioned the uh, pro proclamation that passed reflecting the memorial for Forgotten Chinese Cemetery, which under uh, the homes near the summit of Mount Jumbo. He spoke about the most recent case of anti-Chinese propaganda. And this is what uh, uh, Greg Martin had to say about this. A quote from an article about the 2020 Montana Senate campaign that ran in Foreign Policy Magazine in October of 2020 by Montana journalist Kathleen McLaughlin, who knows a thing or two about Montana politics. She wrote, quote, in one of the most closely watched U.S. Senate races in the country, where Democratic Governor Steve Bullock is running to unseat Republican Senator Steve Daines, China has become a boogeyman deployed by both parties, but particularly by outside Democratic groups pushing for Bullock's election. She pointed to a line of attack that was driven toward Daines regarding his work with Procter & Gamble that was completely disingenuous and seized solely to strum up resentment. Bullock did nothing to speak against this and even raise the issue in debate. And it, Further down the article, she writes, the anti-China messaging throughout the campaign is not subtle. Stacks of glossy mailers show photos of Danes transposed onto a Chinese flag background, shaking hands with unnamed Chinese officials, hearkening back to the Red Scare era of anti-communist propaganda in the 1950s. Okay, and so that's a uh, part of this as we lead into our next uh, uh, presenter, Paul Kim, who reflects on the uh, original uh, presenter on this particular item to council reflect on his efforts in working with council in drafting this uh, proclamation and memorial for the uh, Chinese cemetery that was forgotten. Since we know that uh, the way that we understand our own history is false, uh, since we know that we've forgotten not just Missoula's Chinese community, but Missoula's black community, Missoula's indigenous community, when we know we've consistently digested and discarded the content of these people's lives to fit into our own shallow understandings of ourself, some triumphant narrative about what Western settlement was in this country, why do we choose to continually embrace myth and fantasy over the actual history of what happened here? And I think that the answer to that is that reality the actual history of what happened here, the actual bones in the ground are not a triumphant narrative. They're a story of violence. They're a story of white residents pushing Chinese people out of this city. It's a story of white residents lynching Chinese people in this city. And we can't embrace it as ours because if we were to embrace it as ours, then we would have to consider ourselves complicit in this. We would have to say that the material conditions of Missoula, Montana today are tied by a political project of racial exclusion that directly is tied to the quality of life we live in in the city today. Yep. And in terms of just politics in general, it's, you know, going back to uh, what Greg Martin was also mentioning is that, you know, politics is such a, a messy business in general and you basically grasp for, for straws wherever you can get, can get them. And so you use whatever taxes you have at your disposal. And so Paul Kim uh, later on also uh, um, thanked all the historians of Missoula and council member Daniel Carlino for promoting this and was pleasantly surprised by the amount of attention by local media and how this story has uh, is important to putting a spotlight on the journey of the Chinese workers who never got the prestige in connecting the United who never got the prestige in connecting the United States to the Transcontinental Railroad. His uh, speech was roughly eight to ten minutes long and I wanted to kind of take excerpts from this. Paul used his platform to challenge the council's uh, biases and leave them with this comment and this is uh, you know he uh, he was basically kind of reflecting on the idea of the proclamation and how the city of Missoula decided to kind of more or less whitewash the proclamation. What does it mean to abstract Chinese people such that they aren't the bones underneath the ward you represent, but they are an abstract, they are BIPOC, they're flattened. There's this sort of political arena to comment on, to win political points, whether that's thumping your chest and saying we have to beat China or expecting a medal or points for having brought up the plight of the so-called BIPOC people in Missoula. And how does this prevent us from actually creating a community where we accept and acknowledge each other's differences? Where we genuinely believe that people unlike us can be part of our story in this town. 
And when we sort of appease this performative liberal politics that race is merely an arena to win political points with your fellow white council members, we failed. And I think that's what that effort and that amendment represented. Yep. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's been an interesting few weeks on this topic and it made me forget about the many things happening in council, which, you know, for the 2024 budget is open for comment and we'll have uh, Mayor Jordan Hess talk more about the budget as it reflects the uh, broken taxes, tax system. So he's, uh, I've played this probably many, many times on my morning show, but this is something that the city of Missoula and including Mayor uh, Jordan Hess has been harking on, uh, just kind of throwing the, uh, the um, I guess, uh, throwing the blame over at the state uh, in terms of how they're uh, working with in the tax, uh, this last legislation and beyond. So this is basically him um, talking about the budget and uh, how he's, uh, doing this as well. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm giving a terrible introduction to this, but here it is. The framework, unfortunately, that we have to fund local government. Back in the 1980s, we had four lumber mills that were operating multiple shifts per day, paying high industrial property taxes. We had low residential property values, and we didn't have any tourists. We didn't have very many tourists anyway. Today, uh, we don't have that industrial base economy. Our property values, as you all know, are soaring, uh, and we have three and a half million tourists annually in the city of Missoula, according to the uh, Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research. Our property tax system is based on an economy that doesn't exist anymore, and we're continually trying to wedge a square peg into a round hole, and um, that is problematic. That is uh, reflected in this budget, and that is uh, probably a reason why there are some folks in the room tonight. All right, and so that's what uh, Jordan basically had to kind of kick off and start off with that, and we're going to Go throw it to public comment and here is Emmett uh, he might be known for MCAT stardom of doing awful truth about society and he's talking about the major struggles he's dealing with with uh, his rent going up I don't know what I'm going to do I mean I'm barely in, in, with inflation and everything else you know the poorest of the poor are going to get hit and the houselessness I'm afraid this will contribute to homelessness houselessness whatever you want to call it and we have a problem with house housing in Missoula we do, I think we, and minimum wage jobs, which are a lot of our jobs, just they can't cover the new rents. It's important we have revenue, and, you know, that's interesting about the 80s, because I was going to comment about this, because rent and everything was lower in the 80s. But, you know, I think we can still pay for these good services that we need and still freeze or lower property taxes. We've got to find a way so that all of us can live here in Missoula. Yep, and that was uh, Emmett talking about that. And uh, we're going to throw it over to uh, Chief Admin Officer uh, Dale Bickle. Um, you know, um, uh, let's see, uh, talks about the uh, big line items um, in the form of impact fees. And so this has to, a lot to do with, you know, uh, you know, the money that the city sets aside for investment. And this is what uh, Dale Bickle had to say about that. The impact fees are are um, restricted to spend on infrastructure, infrastructure that has a 10 year, at least a 10 year useful life. And those um, and those funds are only that pro rata share that's attributable, attributable to growth. So um, it's only for those um, th those public infrastructure facilities that are available for new growth. The reason that the current budget only shows um, $500,000 in there is that um, is that it, it has all of those expenditures have to be approved by the impact fee advisory committee now in the in the community investment um, plan that is um, also linked on the website and has all of the construction projects there are a number of projects that you'll see that are um, listed as approved and and for funding it says to be determined and those and many of those to be determined are items um, that have to be approved um, um, by the impact fee advisory committee um, for funding and before those actually go to council for the approval of the construction contracts and what. Yep, so uh, that is just one of the many uh, things that the city uh, looks into investing in. Um, you know, it's not that interesting in a lot of ways um, because there's not a lot of uh, money that's set aside for social programs in general. You know, most of the uh, programs in place is just like, okay, we got to 
you know, like we got to repair the roads, we got to chip and seal all these potholes, we got to do all this stuff. And even those are uh, lacking in some um, cases around the city of Missoula as well. But you got to report these to your city uh, of Missoula to be like, hey, you know, this road is kind of damaged. Use the money for your roads district to improve this area. And so, like, you know, it's it, it does depend. It really does depend on certain things. But if you really like, kind of look at it like this, um, you know, I've been living in Missoula my whole life, and I always look at the the uh, the roads and all that kind of stuff. It's like the roads are kind of like crappy a lot of times most of the year. Uh, you know, especially out coming out of the winter time, and. You know, you think about it like this is like they can't necessarily get on all the roads at all the, all the times because they have limited resources just to repair the roads. And so if they can't even keep the roads as great and pristine as we would like them to be, then how can you expect them to dish out e additional money to help a lot of these other programs, especially with the cost of construction, wages are going up and everything like that. So overall, this, uh, you know, this hearing has been more move to final consideration and will be voted on this coming Monday. The rest of the meeting went in to talk about subdivision, which for the first uh, comment by Ms. Pooley about the population boom in this area was looked into. Basically, this area will be the last to use uh, TEDs. And you know, the area that she was mentioning with the hu all those units and all those places will be using what's called a townhouse exemption development. This was original uh, affordable housing mechanism for the state of Montana before we started initializing TIFs. Then there was the uh, creation of uh, 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 CIDs, or no, SIDs, Special Improvement Districts, which they don't necessarily do anymore because you know they found different ways to uh, uh, curve and uh, leverage development to create sidewalks. But at the same time, you know, it, like sidewalks is a whole nother debate in the city of Missoula. Let me tell you something. Like I'm dealing with that with my neighborhood right now. It's just like, oh, we have to pay for our own sidewalks. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that's basically what it is. Uh, so um, anyways, we're moving on to something even kind of a more troubling thing. And so this is some bad news for Northwestern Energy users, which is pretty much a monopoly in the state of Montana. The power company is looking to increase our fees by 19 percent. Marty Raybane, the city clerk, has her staff uh, talks, uh, talks a little bit more about this. In order to stave off a 19 percent increase in this particular district, uh, so the city administration um, looked at our fund balance uh, for this particular district, and uh, we are recommending that city council put $73,500 uh, toward reducing the impacts of that projected rate increase. Uh, we are also looking at um, applying another year's worth of savings uh, from L the LED conversion that happened in the city limits. Uh, the first year that we had uh, the LED lighting, the city wanted to look at whether it would be possible to address some of the gaps in lighting that you see from house to house and block to block throughout the city. Um, but after a year's analysis, the Public Works and Mobility Department determined that the the savings that had accrued in each of these districts was not sufficient to address gaps in lighting and so therefore uh, we are we are proposing to use uh, the second half of those savings that were uh, created in that first windfall year uh, to reduce the impact of the tax increase okay and so th this is a big part of what the city is uh, being in terms of uh, challenging um, and challenges that they deal with the, on their budget and the bills, the bills that they pay to basically light the downtown, the lighting district. They have their own, they have their own district. They have money allocated for this. Northwest Energy is looking to increase that by 19% for more clarity, which also affects everyone else in the city of Missoula because that is the stuff that keeps the, our uh, downtown lit at night as well. So Public Service Commission is the only organization in Montana that sets the cap for power companies and they are elected officials. This item is something worth looking into and sending your comments to the PSC reps. Uh, you can go on to psc.mt.gov for more information about the people who basically set the rates for Northwestern Energy to not overinflate certain uh, aspects of their energy costs. So, you know, before I wrap up City Council, I also wanted to mention that it's been a year since our 17-year-old, uh, 17 17-year 17 uh, running mayor, John Engen, lost his battle to cancer, and current mayor, Jordan Hess, um, mentioned him in the comments from the mayor, and this is what he had to say. The city of Missoula lost a, a, a giant um, a year ago tomorrow in, in our, our friend and colleague, John Engen. And John was um, 
a, a friend and a, and a mentor and a colleague and a, and a leader in our community. He, he had the biggest heart. He, you know, when, when he was undergoing chemo, we lost our dog. Um, and John in his selfless way, in his selfless way, um, sent us dinner, you know, when he can barely lift his head after chemo. And that's who he was, was someone who cared about other people before he cared about himself. And uh, he lived his life that way and he served our community that way. And um, I miss the guy every day. Uh, he was he was selfless, he was thoughtful, he was compassionate, he was wildly intelligent, he was quick-witted, and he could make you laugh about absolutely anything. And um, and I am blessed to have known him and to have worked alongside him. And um, I just uh, am, will be forever grateful for what John gave uh, our community, but what he gave me personally as well. Okay. And so that was the uh, last comment I wanted to mention before I moved on from City Council. Um, and so far, the public hearing for the budget of 2024 will be ongoing and it will uh, be wrapped up at some point. Uh, usually they do it towards the end of August and if they need to extend it, they go a little bit into September, but they need to get this uh, codified for the uh, 2024 fiscal year. Of course, every quarterly they meet up to uh, address, you know, additional fundings through grants and other impact fees like um, Dale Bickel mentioned in my city council report. Um, up next, we have a look into Montana's constitution, courtesy of Helena Civic Channel. Um, last best constitution with Evan Barrett talks to Marshall Murray, the rule maker. And so here's a little excerpt from the last best constitution. Okay, so you served in six, the 61-63. Yes. When you were in the 61 session, Ted Schwinden was still there. He was the he was the minority leader, yeah, okay. yeah. and Kermit Daniels. <laughs> they well, loved I remember to Kermit from Deer Lodge. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they were good guys, yeah. but they were tough politicians. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I was in the Republican side, and we controlled it. Yeah. And uh, so, they had a lot of fun. Yeah. With well, me and others. When I had Ted uh, in our last series, he was uh, telling us about his 1959-61 experiences, yeah. and then he got bumped. And, and didn't come back until he came when Forrest uh, took over uh, as governor. Yeah. But that kept his career going and mm -hmm. everything else. But uh, he had a lot of reminiscences about the nature of the legislature at that time. Uh, so you were there for two sessions. Yes. And then you uh, w just decided it was time to do, not pursue that Well, anymore. no, I was invited by uh, Babcock and some of the other people, Governor Babcock at that right. time, to run for attorney general. Ah. And I did. Oh, you ran against Forrest in 64. I did, yes. Ah. Sadly, yeah. there was a, an assassination of Kennedy and yeah. Lyndon Johnson went in, and that was a sweep. And that changed the politics all. of the time, yeah. You know, yeah. my great friend Alex Bode was in the legislature right. with me, and a wonderful attorney, a butte right. boy, now in Great Falls in a major firm. Uh, he and I, he ran against Mike Mansfield, and I ran against Forrest. And uh, on the campaign trail down in Billings one day, ran into Forrest. I said, how am I doing? He says, 60-40. <laughs> Absolutely. The count came out 60-40. <laughs> <Yeah. 60 laughs> you know, he was a sharp old Paul. All right. So that was a little taste of the last best constitution. Just kind of seeing the personalities that were uh, part of the CONCON, -con, otherwise it was known as the Constitutional Convention of 1972. So it's very interesting to learn a little bit more about Montana's history because uh, the last best constitution is a good reflection on some of the th the tools that were used for this uh, that lawsuit for the uh, climate change lawsuit that the Montana filed against the state of Montana for not addressing uh, clean and livable climate uh, in accordance with our constitution. So that's pretty much that. And I have a couple events I want to talk to uh, you guys about. Events are happening this weekend in Missoula. And if you want to stay active and indoors with the smoke, Mismo Roots and YMCA here in the Missoula are great uh, venues for people who want to stay indoors and get out of the smoke, but also a great way for kids to get physical and also have uh, families, have gyms and all that kind of stuff. Usually um, hosting family fun times around 1030 a.m. today and tomorrow, uh, different various days. Uh, if you want to stay indoors and open a good book with you and your family, Tiny Tales and Storytime is a good way for uh, kids who are in pre-K to younger 
to, and their parents to listen to stories and get exposure to the fun of reading and activities reflect the books being read. Also, the library is hosting a big read event featuring the book The Cold Millions, which is basically about the labor movement of the early 20th century America. Hmm, sounds relatable. Uh, ongoing events also include luncheons at the Missoula Senior Centers, a.k.a. the best dance floor in Missoula, usually around 11.30 a.m., uh, Saturday markets from River Road to uh, the Red X's by the train station is there's plenty of food trucks, locally sourced produce, and tourist uh, 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 knickknacks for those who like wearing Montana tongue-in-cheek shirts. Uh, and so that's kind of what's happening Saturdays from around 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m. But we're going to talk about more of the persistent ones that are happening this weekend. It is the last weekend for the U Dash River, River Service, starting from noon to about six, uh, with the last ride at 6 p.m. Uh, they're going to be uh, basically take people and their inner tubes or tubes to go float the river. And on the 20th, which is Sunday this weekend, will be the last day this free service will be available for the U Dash River Shuttle service as they transition back into the U Dash, which is meant for uh, transporting college kids to and from their places and around campus as well. Uh, D and D uh, for Guild for adults. If you like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, they do this online event every week on Fridays at 6 p.m. They also have a youth one in the afternoon on Saturdays um, around 3 p.m. Most of these are online, and you just get to uh, hang out with like-minded people like Dungeons and Dragons. So if you're interested in going out and about tonight and enjoying some music, acoustic music by U uh, Lucas Yach at live uh, live music at Ten Spoon Winery at 6 p.m. You got. Uh, Ecstatic Dance with host Valerie Music by DJ Plan um, at Sacred Alley at 6.45 p.m. Live Music with the Benevolence at Crakey Sam Public House at 7 p.m. Paddleheads uh, Baseball Game is going against the Boise Hawks at Orgrin um, Park in Allegiance Field starting at 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, pajama Rama Drag Night. The Zach is doing a drag show uh, featuring some pajamas as well. Um, and that's going to start at 7 p.m. if you're interested in doing that over at the Zootown Arts Community Center. Karaoke at the Jack Saloon is going to be happening at the Jack Saloons tonight at 7 p.m. John Floridus at the Old Post is going to play uh, some acoustic music at 8 p.m. Voted the best uh, uh, solo musician of, Mon uh, of Missoula many years in a row through the uh, now defunct independent <coughs> uh, Nebula on... <laughs> I just pat, uh, moving on. Uh, 9 p.m. Monk's Bar uh, Nebula is going to be playing an out of this world drag show starting at 9 p.m. at Monk's Bar. So you have two drag shows, one at 7 and one at 9 p.m., both in the downtown area, not too far from each other. Nashville 406 Sunrise Saloon is going to be playing some country music on your to wrap up your Friday night for events. As we jump right into Saturday, Missoula Under Construction returns Saturday, August 19th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Fort Missoula Regional Park. This is basically to encourage your kids and uh, youth to uh, mess around with tractors, bulldozers, and so much more in this one-day fun extravaganza where kids drive the big rigs. This is supposed to encourage kids to get into the trades and be involved in, you know, like, like it's a good way for kids to get into interested in engineering for sure. So it's an interesting kind of deal, and it's going to be at Fort Missoula Regional Park from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and it's a great way for... Uh, parents to bring their kids and just see those big rigs and stuff. Hey, some parents might like it too. Uh, Pet Fest. If you're interested in a fun full day with your furry friends, uh, you can go to the Karis Park at 10 a.m. This is, uh, you can basically go congruently with the, uh, the uh, River Street Market by the Carousel for Missoula and service and products to help make your pet healthier, happier, and safe. Most important to the overall message about responsible pet ownership with education through entertainment. Pet Fest is free to attend, but please bring a donation of unopened pet food, and perhaps you might be leave with a new pet of your own. Uh, MAM is doing it again. A uh, uh, Missoula Art Museum is doing a museum tour starting at 11 a.m. every Saturday. You get an in-depth look at all the art installations at the Missoula Art Museum, and they're going to be continuing this well into uh, the fall season. So. Uh, all under one roof, end of summer celebration week. Families First is doing a back to school bash in the Missoula Public Library starting at 11 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Saturday. Help prepare kids for a successful school year. Every August before school starts, Families First puts together a back to school bash where kids can pick up some free school supplies, free school supplies, free school supplies, and welcome in the school year. Come celebrate the end of the summer and beginning of the school year. Uh, summer learning program, Stone Soup. Community Day, Missoula Public Library is also hosting a soup day. Missoula Public Library is third of the team of the Montana uh, Racially 
uh, equity project to bring this fun event to Missoula during the summer learning program all together now. Join for a stories and immersive demonstrations by community members highlighting traditional and cultural activities starting at 11 a.m. They'll read classic stories of Stone Soup by Marcia Brown and start our own Stone Soup at noon. Everyone can add their favorite ingredients to the pot. Ingredients provided. Bring your own bowls and spoons. They'll be start dishing out the Stone Soup at 2 p.m. And you can come meet your neighbor and make some new friends. Back to school bash, like I said, is going to be at the second floor behind the stairs. Uh, Western Montana Genealogical Society Workday, uh, family trees and help from others uh, to this weekly open event on the fourth floor. Fix a clinic, Missoula. Make your space uh, from 1 to 5 p.m. You get to fix your stuff. So if you if you ripped your a hole in your pants and you want to fix it, Missoula, uh, Missoula Public Library is here to help you with that. But they also have other tools in place to help with other various things to help you repair things. Tote Fest or Tot Fest to be more accurate because uh, uh, I always think that Total Fest is KBJ but this is Tote Fest uh, or sorry I keep on saying a uh, tote but even though it's supposed to be tot because they're selling those tots those tater tots and heavy music returns 16 bands on two stages between the dark horse and the sunrise soon there's gonna be a lot of music to enjoy and maybe some tots along the way and so that starts at 2 p.m. and goes to about 2 a.m. Uh, tote Fest at the dark horse bar. Um, Imagination Brewing Company is doing Latent, a Missoula-based band composed of Zach, um, Nick, and uh, Jake. These three fellows have been playing music together for nearly a decade, and this band is a culmination of their endeavors to incorporate absurdity, sincerity, and high-injury music to a single in, um, intense project. And, you know, I, I, I know that a lot of people don't like to be called indie bands because they want to be like more like multi-genre and just all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's basically indie bands. Anyways, Sundog North at Draftworks uh, is going to be a jam band at Draftworks Sundog North. And Nor Northern Lights is going to be the, playing at the Jack Saloon at 7 p.m. on Saturday night. Country Music, um, Summer of Soul. And so this, I don't believe they were able to play this movie last year at Head Start School for the um, North Side Cinema. But they're going to be playing this one. This is basically, you're watching a festival of uh, blues music playing. It's basically like they filmed a documentary and you get to watch it from the perspective of a uh, festival goer for a blues fest so enjoy this thing it looks pretty good i saw the uh, i saw the trailer if you love blues music this is the movie to go to um goose Lamb and th with the new nightmare and uh, center line it's, it's going to be at the zootown arts community center tonight some music there solid snare karaoke at west side lanes as always cash for junkers at 9 p.m at union club uncle funk is going to be at sunrise saloon country music at 9 30 p.m uh, DJ Chris Moon is every night at DJ at the Badlander. So they're doing a berry and brunch uh, on Sunday in R. Lee. This is a farm tours. You pick berries and waffle brunch is waiting for you. This is uh, Sunday, August 20th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. The Sunder Road Farm in R. Lee. And so it costs 30 bucks, but you get to basically get a pint to pick your own berries and you get a whole tour and everything about this farm. So it's a, it is an experience as well. Um, and also uh, Sunday is closing Higgins Avenue from 12 to 4 p.m. for Sunday Streets. So if you're in the downtown area in Missoula, Sunday Streets is happening this weekend. This is a fun and free event that will be highlighting the update the pedestrian bicycle facilities on Bear Track Bridge with free fitness classes and live music. Uh, enjoy streets and activities for all ages and abilities, including art and clay projects, sports and races, music circles, and relaxing book nooks. Every year, community members come together to socialize, walk, roll, bike, skate, dance, and participate in activities on streets temporarily closed to motorized traffic. And if you're in the area, you can go head on over to the Paddleheads game at Oregon Park in Allegianceville. It's starting at 2 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. Uh, the Jack Saloon is doing a back porch party starting at 2 p.m. Um, and then there's the Cat Video Fest at the Roxy Theater. Uh, it's kind of self-explanatory, so it's a lot of videos that features cats. So that's going to be at the Roxy Theater at 2, 4, and 6 p.m. So enjoy your weekend, and feel free to follow me on my Facebook and YouTube pages under Wake Up Missoula, and you can go to MCAT.org to learn more about MCAT and how to make your own show very much like this or something completely different. MCAT is a source for a lot of people in the community to create and share. It is basically a production hub hub for folks that want to use MCAT for our services. One thing that we do not uh, make is commercials. So this is for arts, nonprofit, civic engagement, and more. Um, so that's uh, what MCAT Selling Point is. And if you just kind of want to learn how to edit and make videos and stuff like that, come with a project and we can help you along the way. So that's basically what MCAT's all about. And that's what my morning show is all about. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. So take care.